So good, good afternoon and, and thank you for being here uh, today. My name is Edwin Asturias. I, I hold several hats in what I do, but I, one of them is I, I am the director for Latin America for the Center for Global Health uh, here at the University of Colorado. But I also am the president of the CCIC, so, uh, and this is a joint event between the two organizations, which is uh, good to see them you know, working together, which they have done in the past. Um, and, and we have a, 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 the luxury of having a, a John Andrews with us today. John, I know John from my old days in Latin America and, uh, and recently working together, but uh, uh, he has had a fantastic career, uh, which started in California, where he did his uh, medical school and residence in family medicine to then uh, go to the CDC to be trained in epidemiology and, and uh and disease control, and then basically deploy to to India to sort of help combat smallpox there, and and from there back to Latin America, where he was uh, the right hand man for Dr. Ciro de Cuadros, and and both were a, a fantastic duo, sort of helping us basically eradicate diseases in Latin America, as well as a, a, we can attribute a lot of the success to their leadership and vision in in what Latin America has done in terms of vaccines. Uh, uh, after that, of course, John didn't stop there. He just uh, uh, retired from Pajo and, and went to George Washington University, but also here to the University of Colorado, where he directs the vaccine division for us at the Center for Global Health and, and uh, you know, is working in many aspects of advocacy as well as a, a vaccine uh, deployment. He continues to be a, a great advocate for, an, an expert for WHO and polio eradication, which uh, I think brings him back to his old days of elimination. And, uh, and more recently, another initiative to sort of uh, uh, bring down diseases that are important in, in vaccination way. So it's gonna be a fantastic role for having him sort of talk about the, the, the challenges that we have on, on vaccines and the decade of vaccines, which we are in the second version of it. Before he comes up, uh, I just want to remind people there is a, a provider hepatitis B uh, event for CCIC that's going to be October 22nd. And then on October 24th at the uh, History Museum, I think is, uh, it, it, we're going to have our Big Shots luncheon. And that's a, a special event for not only helping the cause of uh, vaccines in Colorado. Uh, so we invite you to be there. Uh, the great Dr. Peter Jotes, who's a uh, a fantastic sort of a, a, a globetrotter also, and a, and a big advocate for vaccines will be our keynote speaker. So again, John, thank you so much for being with us today. So thank you, Edwin, for those kind words. It's indeed, I'm delighted and honored to be here. Um, I've been asked to talk about the lessons learned from the decade of vaccines and the opportunities for future progress. I'll be speaking um, through my lens as um, an, an experience uh, being a member of the strategic advisory group of experts of WHO's working group on the decade of vaccines. So it's been a, a tremendous uh, honor and learning experience to meet annually and review the data on the progress of the Global Vaccine Action Plan uh, that resulted from the declaration of the decade of vaccines. And also from my uh, experience working at PAHO. Um, uh, it's been, uh, a bit, I feel very fortunate uh, looking back on that experience and the opportunities we had to try to use this technology that in 1993, the World Bank declared as the most effective medical in intervention we have to offer vaccines. And so uh, just wanted to make that um, known. The presentation will cover three aspects. I wanna start off with some background, some context, go into detail about lessons learned and then from there bridge to the opportunities. Uh, I, whenever I have a chance, um, one of the things that we've learned and we've promoted through our work, uh, the working group of the, the decade of vaccines at WHO, um, is the need for partnership going forward. We've been providing recommendations 
what would be the Global Vaccine Action Plan 2.0, what folks are calling IA2030. And uh, partnerships emerge at all levels. And the partnership you have in Colorado through the Colorado Children's Immunization uh, Initiative is exemplary in my mind and should be replicated. And not only at this level, but at the community level, a theme that I'll, that I'll, uh, that I'll be coming back to. Um, so in brief, there's been enormous progress. Um, what was termed the expanded program on immunization, which I often think of as expanded beyond smallpox, um, and the implementation of that program. Um, and there has been a progressive development of the development models, uh, evolution of the development models, um, most recently with the Millennium De Development Goals. I'm sure you're all familiar with those. I'll show you a slide, and now bridging to the Sustainable Development Goals, looking at a target of 2030. Um, just in one slide, it's pretty amazing to think about what's been accomplished uh, from 1977 to 2017, going from, at that time in 1977, six antigens, six vaccines, to currently some 20 vaccines, going from 10 doses per child per year to 20 doses per child per year. These are incredible um, milestones of progress, but they also highlight challenges uh, in terms of capacity to deliver on these products. Going from 5 million uh, children vaccinated, um, children less than one year of age, to 15 million. Um, the cost uh, to vaccinate a child uh, increasing from $5 to, uh, on average, $70. So reflecting back on those six antigens, the price of those vaccines were generally pennies of dose to um, uh, much more um, uh, costly vaccination. Uh, the child vaccina uh, uh, vaccination program, remember what we called the expanded program on immunization, expanded from smallpox, to a term that people are, are, are using more and more, uh, it bridged to routine immunization. And that now is bridged to essential immunization because there's nothing routine about vaccinating every birth cohort of children. It's a it, day-to-day it's a -day grind that never goes away with changing human resources, changing ministries of health, changing leadership. So it's, a, it's work that never goes away. And so it's not, it's, I, I, whenever I get a chance, use the term essential immunization. And it's not a childhood program anymore. It's a family immunization program that covers the life course with opportunities to vaccinate the elderly with influenza seasonal vaccination, pregnant moms um, to prevent the pertussis burden, um, and, and now adolescent um, girls and boys with HPV vaccine. So let's broaden. And then many countries of South Asia and Africa in particular, and to some extent in Latin America, the opportunity of the second year of life. In some countries, particularly my experience in Africa, if a child reaches the second year of life, at the point of service, that nurse immediately thinks, oh, you're beyond you may not be vaccinated, but that was the first year of life. And, and we need to reset the target or the, the bar to uh, a, no, a better understanding and knowledge and practice that if that child is unvaccinated at any age, uh, that the two, second year of life provides an opportunity. Um, the Millennium Development Goals are briefly uh, summarized in this uh, slide. I'm sure you're all familiar with them. And uh, of the eight, there are three that are um, directly linked to um, immunization programs. Um, the fifth goal was to reduce mortality, maternal mortality, by, by three quarters. Um, the other goal to reduce child mortality, uh, the target there was by two thirds. Um, using 1990 as the um, starting date. Now, you know, in preparing this talk, I had completely forgotten 
Then in 2008, we actually published a paper at PAHO that got uh, uh, accepted in health affairs, uh, reflecting on where we were with immunization in terms of achieving that mortality reduction target. So we did an analysis, and what we learned is the data is not always obvious. It's not always there. And when it is collected, it's not always of high quality. Um, as we learn more and bridge to the end of the Millennium Development Goals and bridging to the SDGs, we're finding probably half of the countries regularly reporting on the key indicators. And this is so important. If you're going to have these uh, goals and targets, anything worth doing, uh, I've often heard say, is worth measuring. And so it's a very important uh, to measure impact. Um, partnership was also uh, a goal that uh, immunization has been key in working towards developing national capacity, the National Immunization Technical Advisory Group. Uh, the equivalent in the United States is the ACIP, I'm sure you're all familiar with, that forms policy decisions on new vaccines. And that, that is, um, in, I think has led to increased um, um, access. And, to, and looking through the PAHO lens again, the work that has been done at PAHO uh, with its PROVAC initiative, which stands for promoting vaccination, uh, was um, had a mission to enhance the capacity of nations, of national programs, to use their local evidence uh, local information to guide policy decisions. And so a lot of work has been, uh, uh, has gone into that. Recall that in the old days when vaccines were pennies a dose, oftentimes policy decisions came from the regional level. Let's eradicate polio. Let's eliminate measles and rubella. Um, and now with um, the challenges of um, uh, more complicated vaccines, not always providing 100% efficacy, um, more costly vaccines. Countries really need to have that capacity to make this decision on themselves. And so a lot of work has gone into that. And then the Sustainable Immunization uh, Development Goals, which is a broader footprint print, basically, of the MDGs. And, and, and immunization continues to play um, a key component of this, of the 17 uh, goals, uh, immunization is directly linked to WHO as an example on their website in four of them. So amazing opportunities um, going forward. Now there are gaps because uh, when trying to look at diarrheal disease, recall that pneumonia and diarrhea, diarrhea are the biggest killers of children in many countries. And uh, there are other interventions to prevent and control diarrhea besides vaccines, specifically rotavirus vaccine. So WASH needs to be a key integrated strategy. And then although when you click, you go onto the website and you click and, you, and it shows linkages, WHO is not included in the linkage. And having been a part of PAHO's team responding to the Haitian cholera epidemic, that was fundamental. You could not overlook the importance of WASH in a country that before the earthquake um, uh, already had huge challenges with terms of WASH. So using immunization, I think, and all these targets and goals um, as a potential uh, influencer. Um, so fast forward to um, 20. 10, 20, 11, 2012, um, in the early um, days of this decade, um, Bill Gates decided, based on the progress that I highlighted, that reflects progress in other regions of the world as well, that why don't we declare this decade the decade of vaccines? And when he was alive, Dr. Cyril de Quadros, a dear mentor of mine, um, was a key uh, um, uh, supporter of that notion. Um, and the, it, it, it uh, used and was embracing uh, a world in which all 
uh, individuals and communities would enjoy lives free from vaccine preventable diseases. It was Albert Sabin who said that it, uh, we could discover vaccines, but if they sit on a shelf, what a tragedy. So that's a key part of this that uh, from that vision led to a mission statement that the mission of the decade of vaccines is to extend by 2020 and beyond the full benefits of immunization to all people, regardless of where they're born, who they are, or where they live. So um, I'm an optimist, and I appreciate um, altruistic, um, laudable targets. Uh, I have a sense of pragmatism, but uh, some of which uh, may not be achievable. But when you compare the status quo with having a target or a goal, I think there's some influence there. You have to balance that. It'll be impossible to eradicate all poverty, for example. The term eradication is perhaps overused. But having a target that brings folks together, particularly partners supporting uh, country work, I think is, um, has been very useful. So I uh, wanted to stay, say that up front. Now, from this vision and the call for action, uh, the decade of vaccines, uh, WHO and key partners developed what is called the Global Vaccine Action Plan. Can I see a, a show of hands who is familiar with this term GVAP in the audience? Not everyone. Um, so you go from a mission statement, a declaration, to something, a tool that's going to be used and uh, much like the MDGs and much like the SDGs provides a roadmap for folks to be engaged and involved. You may not be able to do everything, but based on perhaps you run an organization, perhaps you oversee the work of an NGO, a non-governmental entity that's located in Haiti, you can always reflect on and use the opportunity that the, the Global Vaccine Action Plan provides in enhancing your work and accountability. And here was to achieve a world free of poliomyelitis, meet the vaccination coverage targets in every region, country, and community, exceed the Millennium Development Goal 4, remember the reduction in childhood mortality, uh, meet uh, regional and global uh, elimination targets. We'll come back to this. Every region, every all six regions have measles elimination targets. Um, and uh, finally, develop and introduce new and improved vaccines and technologies. Recall I mentioned PROVAC in the Americas. Um, this kind of global vaccine action plan supported that work, particularly when we were trying to um, help countries decide on the use of pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, rotavirus vaccine, HPV vaccine, and the fourth being seasonal influenza vaccine. Based on country feedback, those were the priority areas of work that PAHO embraced uh, going forward. So the targets, uh, uh, the, the strategies toward attaining those uh, goals are highlighted in this slide. I, I won't go into details, but to give you um, um, an, a broad picture of how this was operationalized um, country by country with the commitment to immunization being a priority. And that is linked to country ownership um, and community demand. Um, key components of this. Now, I mentioned I've had the honor of serving on the working group, and year, we put out a yearly report. This is the example of the 2018 report. Uh, and one of the key findings coming out of that report is summarized in this slide, um, showing middle-income countries that are not GAVI-supported. Show of hands, who is, a, who is familiar with this term GAVI? basically all of you. It's an entity um, that was uh, originally uh, funded by uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and now many partners and governments, including the US government, 
to provide the support to countries to introduce these life-saving vaccines, starting with pneumococcal vaccine and rotavirus vaccine and now HPV vaccine, and also help them increase the coverage of the routine. Uh, again, I'm, I'm, I made the mistake of using that uh, term, but the other essential uh, vaccines of the program uh, and help them with capacity development. And you see um, the low-income countries and middle-income countries in the color codes there that are Gavi supported uh, compared to in the darker blue and the, uh, I guess, um, the, that color of high-income countries. I'm not sure what I call it, I guess rose. But you see there is a difference um, between uh, countries that are Gavi supported and those that are not in the middle income country group um, uh, for the introduction of pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. And then uh, you can see that the total expenditure on immunization and resources uh, varies significantly between the different categories of countries using again this terminology uh, again, the difference between Gavi-supported countries and countries that are, 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 that are basically on their own, non-Gavi middle-income countries. And so that obviously raises challenges to those countries not being supported on uh, trying to provide these life-saving vaccines. Um, one of the lessons learned that we didn't analyze, but this is, uh, comes from work that we did um, uh, from PAHO to show in the line. The line that you see there is the number of countries that have um, created and introduced legislation for a vaccine. The model legislation that we would consider um, very much value added would be uh, some sort of law that would mandate all children be vaccinated in our country, that we pay for that that we have a national leader running the program and that there is a national vaccine immunization plan of action that gets updated annually. So that's kind of the language that we encourage countries to consider when considering a vaccine law. And these have been tremendously uh, effective in the countries of Latin America linked to national ownership. Now the bars show, again, uh, color-coded with the darker blue showing external funding source and the lighter yellow uh, short showing the national funding source in terms of financing. And again, it highlights the country ownership that exists in Latin America and the Caribbean. Bridging fast forward to this year's analysis, it has been, the report has been embargoed. I believe it's gonna be released this week um, at Geneva. Uh, there's a uh, vaccine meeting going on, uh, but I am able to show some of our preliminary findings that will go into the report, beginning with the polio eradication and neonatal tetanus elimination initiatives. On the left, that slide is um, dated as of July 17, but we now know that there's some 78 wild virus cases this year globally compared to 17 last year. Bottom line, we'll come back to this, polio is backsliding. This is a bad year for polio. And for me, it's very sad, and we'll talk about some of the issues. And then neonatal tetanus has uh, progressed, uh, um, and uh, certainly, as I men mentioned, uh, measles um, uh, elimination, um, actually that's on the right is neonatal tetanus, um, the graph in the middle is this issue of circulating vaccine-derived polioviruses. These occur as a result of our vaccination activities. When there's low immunity, poor program performance, essentially a fragmented national immunization program, you're gonna have pockets of children with low coverage who are susceptible that when vaccinated, uh, those susceptibles will um, um, allow the emergence of a mutated uh, vaccine that begins to look a lot like wild virus. And in fact, 
Nigeria is now exporting these circulating vaccine derived viruses to neighboring countries. So it's not only, it's, it's acting like wild virus. So to think that we're only speaking about the eradication of wild virus uh, is um, very concerning uh, because that's a mixed message. Well, you said we eradicate this disease. What about these other uh, paralytic cases caused by the vaccine? So um, I raised that issue. And then, uh, I, as I mentioned, there's a lot of progress with measles, uh, rubella, particularly here in the Americas and, and in other regions. All six regions have targets. There are um, uh, data to show under five mortality has been pretty, the reduction has been pretty s substantial, but as you can see, it's plateaued. And um, that, that um, there are opportunities there uh, to save uh, more lives. Um, the challenge will be around the perinatal period. Um, and so that's the focus going forward. One lesson, one message I'd like to leave with you is that folks often talk about global coverage, national coverage. I find that, okay, it's okay to mention that, but it doesn't provide the complete picture. Um, we need to drill down to community levels. And when you look at tease out selected antigens, you see there's great vari variability. So again, we need to be more specific about what we're talking about. These broad uh, generalizations that globally we've reached 86% coverage um, uh, is, is fine, but that means that uh, country by country that varies highly, uh, is highly variable and community by community. Uh, poverty plays a role. Um, Edwin Asturias yesterday in a talk uh, nicely highlighted uh, this issue in a series of other slides. I summarize it through our report here, looking at quintiles, um, and you show uh, the greatest difference between the lowest quintile and the highest quintile, with red reflecting uh, the biggest challenges. And again, um, Africa, uh, South Asia, um, and there are also challenges in the Americas. Knowing where, um, well, in this slide summarizes the introductions and there have been, uh, as mentioned previously, great progress in those countries that are uh, supported by Gavi. On the left, you see uh, the progress with regards to introduction of the new vaccine is also plateaued. Uh, but if you consider IPV being an introduction in many countries, then there's uh, uh, a suggestion of greater progress. Um, getting back to my point, knowing what's going on at the community level so you can target resources, here we see the percent of municipios in um, Latin America, municipios being a district, a county. Um, with DPT3 uh, vaccination coverage greater than 80 percent, and there's a, a, a huge variability in those countries uh, achieving that target and those countries that have not. Uh, data as of uh, 2017. I find that the work being done in Honduras is amazing. I often cite Honduras and Bangladesh as being uh, among the best national immunization programs we have. Uh, just uh, huge challenges going forward but they always seem to have um, solutions to those challenges. And here is an innovative approach to um, rapid coverage monitoring in very small communities to get a handle of what's going on. And then not just creating the information or collecting, taking action. That's the key, using the data for action. Now coverage, you're all probably aware of the challenges. Numerator data, denominator data. I can't tell you how many country evaluations I've been on where you try to track from the point of service where a nurse may be recording the number of children vaccinated and then knowing in that district there are so many such nurses and you try to collect that information and understand, add it up, 
does that match with what's being reported? And then there are issues of denominators. So when we go through this process of adding up, even the sum might be miscalculated. Someone sitting there doing the arithmetic makes a mistake. So data quality is always challenging, using that as an example um, in monitoring coverage. So we need to think also, knowing where disease is happening. In this case, this is an excellent example in my mind of Nepal, a spot map of measles cases. And knowing that there, there looks like there are two very high risk uh, districts there um, that need um, better supervision and support as an example. In this example, this is a DRC showing the circulating vaccine derived poliovirus outbreaks. Remember, this is, originates from the actual oral polio vaccine and it causes an outbreak. And you see over the years 2017 to 2019, the cases. Uh, so knowing where these are occurring reflects that it's a fail, it's a fractured program and that these locations need more support. Same with rotavirus and invasive uh, bacterial disease. Uh, the surveillance that's being developed, it builds on the polio, builds on measles, rubella, new vaccine introduction to have a more comprehensive surveillance system as an example. The other example of enhancing uh, national ca capacity, but also accountability, is this work being done at the national level, the national uh, immunization technical advisory groups that I mentioned earlier. And you can see the number um, growing globally on the left and color-coded on the right. This is important progress. Um, at PAHO, we had the regional uh, technical advisory group initially chaired by uh, D.A. Henderson, who directed the Global Smallpox Program. Um, when I was director of the immunization program at PAHO, a D.A. retired and stepped down, and I had the opportunity to appoint Cyril de Quadros, who was um, an amazing leader, if, if any of you uh, met or worked with him. And subsequently now, Dr. Peter Figueroa from Jamaica is the chair. So the work continues, and that has now been replicated at the national level. Recall that we need to use uh, much more the national community level surveillance uh, for policy decisions. Now, research is always mentioned, and I could spend a whole talk on the potential vaccine candidates by disease and where they are in preclinical trials and where, where they are in clinical trials if they made it that far and subsequent licensure, the decision on policy, and then at equally important, the results of deployment. And I always say rapid deployment because if you decide to introduce uh, a vaccine that significantly reduces more mortality, in the case of pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, the, any hesitancy or lack of sense of urgency to deploy that vaccine allows children to die unnecessarily. So that sense of urgency in public health, we always have in eradication, but in the day-to-day -day work of essential immunization, it should also remain high uh, as a guiding principle. Um, we once had a measles rubella elimination campaign in Peru delayed because a parliamentarian stood up to say, this vaccine will create autism. You know the Andrew Wakefield story and the egregious action uh, he took in publishing those false Report, the, the false report that got published in Lancet, and the ripple effect, even though his license was rescinded in um, the UK, but the ripple effect, the damage had been done, um, that vaccine does not cause autism. Rubella infection causes autism. And so um, 
that's an example of uh, another challenge, uh, communication and the vaccine hesitancy that's emerging. Um, the NITAGs are looking for ways to um, combat that. But my point is, um, research is also important. I want to come back, though, and I could spend a whole talk on that, I, but I want to look at the other technologies that I think are equally important, such as a technology that would be a game changer in the way we manage the cold chain. Think about it. From the factory to the point of service, the moment the needle pricks the, fin uh, the skin, there needs to be this unbroken cold chain in order to protect the vaccine potency. And in the case of the Ebola vaccine work and the field trials, it was recognized this particular vac vaccine needed a much uh, lower temperature to maintain its potency. Traditionally, we think of two to eight degrees for most viral vaccines. This one was you know, close to minus 70 in that range. And uh, so that pointed out the current system is not going to handle it. And in going to where the outbreaks occurred was operationally very challenging and extended the current system. So not only was the current system not uh, sufficiently um, <coughs> prepared to um, um, use this vaccine, it needed a great modification, but it, its footprint could not, it didn't exist to reach where people we're dying and where the vaccine would obviously need to be used. So this uh, Arctic um, technology was amazing. And you can see this is something that you can transport and, and carry relatively easy uh, compared to a walk-in refrigerator or a big, big freezer that you would otherwise have to store this vaccine <coughs> that would never reach that point of service where it's needed. So that's why I call it a game changer. Another game changer is imagine a situation where you take your child to the grocery store and on one of the shelves is, are band-aids and they're not the traditional band-aids for lacerations or abrasions. These are vaccine band-aids. Imagine this micro patch where it would, uh, in the case of research currently going on, uh, it's being done for um, IPV, polio, it's being looked at for seasonal influenza um, and a few other vaccines. But So imagine this, that as a mom or a dad, you peel off it, slap the Band-Aid on, and these little uh, spikes in the patch are uh, penetrate the skin and the, are uh, absorbed, and it initiates the innate response at the, uh, at the, in the skin, the dendritic cells and the whole uh, cascade of the immune response uh, is initiated and doesn't, and imagine it doesn't need the cold chain. Uh, so, and imagine you don't need to go see a nurse or a doctor, you can circumvent that. So this is exciting for me. This is really exciting uh, work that I hope uh, advances another game changer. It's always important at getting back to trust, getting back to demand, and getting back to uh, confronting vaccine hesitancy to be very clear about what the potential adverse events and that each country monitor those. You see here by region um, the um, work being done to monitor um, uh, adverse events. And it'll be very important to be honest about each antigen it's very complicated. You may have um, uh, an antigen. Let's go back to pneumococcal vaccine. The vaccine has serotypes that, that are covered, but there are other serotypes that cause disease. And, uh, and so it won't be completely effective. We can cite the same example for uh, human papillomavirus vaccine with the seven valent vaccine or, or the two valent vaccine, 70% is estimated uh, of the disease burden was prevent, prevented. So increasing the number of types in the vaccine will increase uh, the likelihood of reducing disease burden. But you see that communicating that, plus the side effects, if there are any, to 
families to communities to maintain trust is very, very important. That's why I want to be sure that I, I highlight this uh, important work. So at this point of my presentation, I'd like to summarize some of the points and the opportunities to go forward to recognize that there's been unprecedented effort that was put forth in the Global Vaccine Action Plan. I didn't mention that Cyril and others went from region to region to get country buy-in, but folks would, and it was unprecedented. Uh, there, uh, some people feel that there could have been more bottom-up uh, input, but to the extent possible at that time, it was better than what has ever been done. So going forward with the new action plan, what people are referring to as the IA 2030, there's uh, a lot of work in trying to improve um, bottom-up uh, input. Uh, and align that with the development initiatives. And uh, there again, it's a balance. How much can immunization do with those 17 initiatives? Yes, probably you could think of ways for each one, including climate change. But uh, let's come back to the real world situation that one nurse at the point of service providing a lot of um, services and support to the community. And then, as I mentioned, um, I hope that most of us are optimists, that we value aspirational targets and that we see sometimes that they may not be practical in, uh, in being 100% certain we're going to reach them, but it will help galvanize uh, commitment and support. Um, High quality surveillance is essential. I showed you a couple of examples uh, that would help with determining where the high risk communities are that the, the uh, traditional approach to coverage monitoring um, doesn't always work. Uh, polio eradication needs to be reintegrated back into the program. I've, I did not mention that it is separated. It was separated some years ago thinking that it needed more focused, high-level support. Uh, at hindsight, it's always um, uh, easier to do, but I, I, at that time, I was um, very outspoken about that would be a mistake. In Latin America and the Caribbean, we never separated polio from essential immunization. Polio becomes a side, a side benefit if you promote the capacity of the team, uh, the, their, their opportunity to reach children with all the antigens, polio becomes a side benefit. And that's a lesson learned that every region is employing with the measles rubella. The flagship uh, of the program is essential immunization. The campaigns only need to be done every four years, but we'll come back to that. Um, I feel, as did the working group, that the new strategy, the new vision, should not uh, omit the unfinished agenda. So polio needs to be get, uh, finished. Um, it's, uh, it has some huge challenges, but there are some other elimination targets that are, um, that are on the table uh, that have commitment of many countries and regions. The research and innovation uh, being done is essential. But I meant my message is that not just for vaccines, for these other opportunities to strengthen operations. And I did not cite many of the in innovations used to strengthen supervision. Uh, in some countries, uh, vaccinators are not always honest about where they go. So if there were devices to show that they actually delivered the vaccines, that in those um, uh, countries will be important as an example. Vaccine demand has emerged in all our discussions. It's not just the U.S. anymore. Um, we happen to be one of the more litigious societies in the world, but it, there is a spillover. And I cited the example in Peru where the par parliamentarian stood up and said, this will cause autism. It delayed the campaign for a year. Ten cases of congenital rubella syndrome occurred in that year of delay. Totally preventable. Um, and yet uh, it happened. And I'll skip this um, 
and come back to a final point. Um, you may think I'm crazy, but let me try to convince you in the remaining moments that we have together. So um, I do want to um, acknowledge Luke Hooper, who died a few days ago. Um, Lou was a dear friend and a committed colleague, a former president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, who was at the right place at the right time in the 60s in the New York City area when outbreaks of congenital rubella syndrome were occurring. And I often refer to him as the grandfather of the epidemiology of congenital rubella syndrome. He was passionate, and his wife as well, um, Patty. Um, and in this article, we highlight why now. And I think uh, in the next series of slides, I want to touch upon um, some of those uh, answers, so beginning with disease burden and economic burden, followed by um, the security risk and the link to global health security that measles rubella provides. It's operationally feasible, certainly technically feasible, and this is a part of the Global Vaccine Action Plan and will be a part of IA 2030, and the opportunity for partnerships and legacy. Well, measles in Latin means miserable. This child is miserable. Do any of you, do you recognize any other clinical findings that might put this child at risk, aside from having measles infection? Well, I don't see any hands, but note the receding hairline, the reddish tinge to the hair. I, I think that one gentleman knows the answer. This child has vitamin A deficiency. So the risk of blindness, death, is substantially greater uh, than a child who is healthy and that in many, uh, it contributes to the mortality in many countries of Af Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Uh, so in Latin, miserable, even if you don't have vitamin A deficiency. Now it's, this year you've followed the newspapers, followed the reports, it's not been a good year for measles globally, let alone the US. And the, much of the problem has originated in New York State and New York City, the, the terms are used to separate the two outbreaks, um, largely due to the response in my mind. New York City responded uh, with several hundred, if not a couple of thousand health workers to employ a rapid response and contain the outbreak. Whereas New York State and specifically um, the county, there was a, I want to say Rodman County, it's not Rodman, Rockland County, thank you, thank you, Rockland County, where the response was slow and had less support in terms of human resources, and so the outbreak just took off, as you see, and um, the rest of the country also had challenges, but as I always cite in, when I visit countries in Latin America, one of the best practices of the United States is its rapid response. You think about Disneyland, how Disneyland seeded several communities in the U.S., and the response stopped transmission in each of those seedings. This um, happened also this year in the United States, but again, problem coming back to uh, New York. But you can see the footprint of measles this year in the U.S., now, the outbreak in the, uh, New York started in, um, uh, it was around September 30th of last year. So if transmission continues beyond September 30th, that will be more than one year, and by definition, will um, we, uh, or PAHO, um, must take a decision that the U.S. has lost its measles-free status. I happen to chair the PAHO uh, Regional Commission on Measles Rubella Elimination, the verification of countries uh, documenting that they've eliminated measles and rubella. 
Uh, and it would be very sad if that were uh, put on our uh, agenda um, that the data clearly show transmission has gone more than a year. Like we would, it's sad for any country. Colombia is confronted with that. Venezuela has gone more than a year. So they've lost their measles free status. It looks like Brazil has too. And they have done that twice within the last um, six, seven years. So it takes a full year to develop the evidence to convince the commission that you regain your measles free status. You have all the data, all the evidence to show, show from the uh, epidemiologic and virologic data that we have available, you've stopped transmission. So we will decide you're measles free again. You can see that countries going in and out with transmission anywhere in the world. So there's a question of sustainability. Um, but we won't know about the US uh, for a few weeks because um, you will need some time uh, to document for at least six weeks that there's been no transmission. And that will happen six weeks from uh, September 30th. Uh, so more to come on that. Um, and the issue was, it wasn't an issue with the vaccine. It's always an issue in most, 99% of the cases, country by country, um, under vaccination. That's the point of this slide. And importations, you see foreign visitors, but a lot, most cases, I wish I had the data to show you, it's an American citizen going overseas that is susceptible, gets it, the infection, brings it home, which starts the outbreak. And schools play an incredible role. Um, in this case of New York, in, it was a cultural issue. It was in a religious group um, that had not vaccinated their children. And here, uh, very excellent data showing uh, in this geographic uh, map the distribution of, of schools uh, that have under-vaccinated children. So this is really a key part of the problem. And when children who are incubating this virus and are infection, infectious and communicable, when they go to the school, you can see that the schools amplify the outbreak. So fortunately, action can be taken and actually was done um, by governor uh, by the governor of new york which was the uh, strengthening of the vaccine law that they already had had to reduce uh, exemptions so excellent work it's been done in other states i think california was another state that has uh, taken this path that i that i uh, very much appreciate not cheap to have an outbreak so think about 2,000 health workers in New York City responding. Uh, you can imagine the cost. Um, and uh, so you can see what I'm leading to, my final point at the end will be a global target to help the six regions to strengthen their work and reduce this aspect. I'm running out of time and I wanna leave time for questions. So. You know, uh, if I were to go point by point, it's hugely expensive and justifies a global target. And there are challenges with the transmission of this virus. It's the most infectious virus in the world. But the strategies work, they're feasible. We've analyzed this very carefully and they always rely as in any um, eradication initiative, rapidly immun immunizing susceptibles through the essential immunization services, certainly supplemental information, uh, immunization is needed. And in the case of measles, that's every four years. So you can continue to invest in human resources, invest in your management and supervision, surveillance, and so on. And it works, here are the data. Uh, unfortunately, Venezuela uh, has been an outlier and uh, we're working to stop transmission there, PAHO and, and, and partners. There is this relationship with rubella, so you get a twofer. If you do uh, uh, and go after measles, you'll get, and this is why I personally am involved because as a uh, primary care physician, to be able to eliminate this disease that this child will suffer for the rest of their life, and it's underreported. 
rubella in the first tri in the first 10 weeks of pregnancy that child has a 90 percent risk of having these sequela that i've shown in the last two slides um, in demand going forward uh, i've cited a number of examples but don't have time uh, you've all heard about the columbia hpv setback a few years ago in one school there was a group of um, adolescent girls vaccinated in a public space without any sense of privacy or respect for privacy. And so if one girl faints, it's infectious in terms of um, the hysteria. Coverage at the national level dropped from 80% as a result of the mismanagement of that local event to a national um, uh, miscommunication. So people, uh, I could, we could spend the rest of the day talking about vaccine hesitancy. Um, Edwin, who just walked in, um, Edwin Asturias and his team, Sean O'Leary uh, from um, Denver is another global expert and doing great work in vaccine hesitancy, helping the work that you do I like to reinforce that. And it's all about this point of service. Again, the acknowledgement of the work done in Nepal. The, on the right there, you see two female community uh, health workers. And the part of their um, work is vaccination. Nepal went through a decentralization process. Any country that goes through decentralization usually has a drop in coverage that takes three or four years to recover from because finances, supervision gets decentralized and it varies by district. You saw the Nepal map on measles and the outbreaks, but the, this cadre of workers did not change and their vaccination coverage remained stable. It didn't increase, but it didn't drop and credit should go to them. And I think that's what it's all about. Community engagement, community demand. And I had an opportunity to interview them and learn from them. So in summary, unprecedented uh, progress. I have raised um, the opportunity uh, to use measles rubella to uh, continue and sustain the progress. And it does have some um, incredible opportunities for uh, global health security. There's no quick fix. Uh, it's a long-term vision that I hopefully the IA 2030 will incorporate, uh, particularly with what I feel very important, uh, an investment in human resources, that day-to-day -day work that's so vitally important. So I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot for everybody for coming and uh, taking the time. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah, so um, the Gavi was formed in 2000 or so. Uh, and the first executive director was Tori Godal, a retired uh, WHO uh, leader who headed the research, the vaccine research of WHO for many, many years. And based on the, um, the uh, funding available, the challenges going forward, their intent was to support the poorest of the poor countries. They didn't have, a, they had a nice budget, but they didn't have an unlimited budget. So they chose to target those countries initially who had a GDP of less than $1,000. And that left then some 74 countries or so to start with to target their resources. Now, there were several, uh, I was one of those, that proposed other metrics for determining who they were going to support. Because actually most of the poorest of the poor, most of the poverty exists in middle-income countries um, that are currently not being supported by Gavi. 
And so the concern at that time was, are you creating uh, a pool of par po poverty uh, that will lag behind? And I think you saw the results. So um, perhaps there'll be, we tried to create a global, do, replicating what you are doing here in Colorado, a global coalition that would incorporate all countries, not just Gavi recipient countries, but all middle income countries who cha were challenged with uh, the new vaccine issues that I mentioned, sustaining the old vaccines, preventing them and responding to measles outbreaks, pertussis, um, they're all challenged. And it, 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 we wanna maintain national ownership, but strategic, country by country, strategic help can influence performance. Great question, thank you, Madam. Yes, please. That's a great question. We could spend a lot of time. I'll try to highlight a couple of my own observations. Um, Merck's done a lot with the uh, prevention of blindness through the River Blindness pro Project in Africa by donating, donating ivermectin over the years. And so a hugely philanthropic uh, effort. Um, in terms of best practices and the best model that I believe or two things. One is the Serum Institute of in India. Uh, we couldn't have eliminated measles rubella in the Americas without their help. Their vision was more of a public health vision to provide a vaccine that was affordable compared to the current, or at that time, the current listing of prices and allowed countries to do that campaigns to eliminate, particularly rubella, where you have to have an expanded target but if you do it well, you eliminate CRS. And never, in my experience, have you been able to do a public health intervention where you can tick off a disease as bad as that one is. So the point is that that needed an investment, though, and it needed affordability of a product that would allow the investment to happen. And we're talking about, in terms of breadth of work, uh, that one campaign, you're targeting all women of reproductive age and men because they could be a pool uh, to sustain transmission. So you do both men and win, women, and on average, it's about by country by country, it was less than 40 years of age. And uh, the Cyrus Punawala, who is the owner uh, of the, the, the primary owner of uh, Serum Institute, saw the opportunity and took action to help PAHO support countries um, eliminate congenital rubella syndrome. And PAHO actually gave him a special award to recognize that. So I use that as an opportunity that when uh, a vaccine manufacturer, a leader, has this opportunity to uh, better position their support while maintaining profit and their um, constituency of investors, uh, it can be done. That's a great example. The meningococcal A, are anybody familiar with that initiative in terms of new vaccine development led by Mark LaForce and others, um, started by interviewing ministers of health. What would be an affordable price if we had this vaccine that's killing children in the meningococcal belt of Africa? Huge killer. They all said, well, they came up with the conclusion $2 a dose. So the vaccine development from the get-go had as that target, that vision, $2 a dose. And, and, and it's just amazing. So it needs some innovation. I think um, there, 
producers are vitally important. That we're all in this together. And, and, and there is some research and development costs. But um, a public health model and vision amongst um, uh, industry is always something I try to promote. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.